want you to imagine you get a notification on your phone. It's a long message, too long for you to be able to read on the notification. So you open it. You have this long message um, from a friend of yours. You don't know this person very well, but, um, you know, you know them decently well. But it's a long message, and they're asking for your help. This person is basically asking you, hey, you have what it takes to meet my need in this situation. Can you please sacrifice of your time? Can you please sacrifice your energy? And can you please help me with this situation? It's really hard, and, and I really need your help. And you get that notification. You read that, and you think, well, I, yeah, I can help. I mean, that would take some sacrifice, and that would be a lot for me to do, but I could, I could do it. And then as you're contemplating your answer maybe in the next couple of days, you find out that that person, that you know, mutual friend of yours, whatever, who sent you that request for help was really doing it with a whole group of people over their shoulder. Now, that's not so bad to ask in a group of people, but what this person was doing was they were typing this out together with all these other people and basically asking for something that made the person that was asking you look good. This person wanted to be seen as smart and intelligent. So they asked you this big, long thing that looked really intelligent, and it made them look good to the people that were sitting next to them. And you find all this out. I don't know how you find something like this out. Maybe another friend is there, and they basically tell you that request was not a real request. They weren't really asking you for anything. I mean, they did ask you for something, but it wasn't genuine. It wasn't sincere. That person was actually just using you to look better in front of the people that they were around. How would you feel if someone told you that, right? And for some of you, maybe that's a real situation. Maybe that's happened to you before. And my point is not to say, imagine this is a real situation. I want to tell you that this situation happens all the time, but the person who asks is perhaps you. And the person who hears is God. And when we pray and we ask God for things, but we don't mean what we're saying, but we say words to him, but we don't really mean it. Or we ask things in front of other people when we're praying in a group or maybe in a small group or at home with your family and you pray for stuff to make you look good, but you're not really meaning what you're saying. You're not really asking those things. You know that God sees right through it. I mean, that was the whole sermon last week, right? That God sees through any kind of hypocrisy and he's not impressed by any hypocrisy and he sees right through it right? Well, think, it's the same thing when it comes to our prayer. If we pray things, and remember what prayer is. Prayer is us talking to God, right? It's asking things of God. It's talking to God about God or about us or about whatever. That's what prayer is. But if we talk to God and we don't mean what we say, and if we're using prayer as an opportunity to look more righteous or holy or good in front of other people, you understand that God knows that the moment you pray. He knows it even before you pray. And you'd have to expect, just like giving, we talked about last week, if you give in order for people to think you're generous, and that's your motive, Jesus says, well, you're going to get no reward from God. He says the same thing this week when it comes to prayer. If you pray and you ask for things so that people will look at you and say, look at that righteous person. Look at that holy person. Wow, they're better than I thought. Wow, I didn't know they were so smart. Wow, I didn't know they felt all those things. Wow, I'm really impressed. If that's the reason while you pray what you pray, just know that God understands that, and God does not want to answer that kind of prayer. This is, a, this is a warning for us. We don't want to insult God in that way, so we all should turn to this passage. Let's look at it together. Matthew chapter 6, look at verse 5. That's where we're going to be um, all morning, Matthew 6, 5 through 8. We're going to look at these four verses. We looked at four verses last week, four verses this week, and it's all about prayer and hypocrisy and motives. Like, Jesus condemns people, and what he says about them is they love to pray. Jesus says, oh, these people who love to pray, shame on them. Could you imagine Jesus saying that? Like, imagine you love to pray, and Jesus says, oh, hypocrites love to pray too. They love it. They love to pray in front of other people. They love to ask big things of God and raise their voices out of it. They love to do that, right? Because... They want people to think they're righteous. They want people to think they're good. And they love that too. So let's look at this together. Verse 5, Matthew 6, 5 says, And when you pray, which is funny, when you pray. He doesn't say, hey, if a disciple chooses to pray sometimes, 
He doesn't say, hey, if maybe one day you find yourself talking to God, he assumes that you will pray. Just like he assumes that you'll give to people that need it in your life. He assumes that you'll pray. That's a funny start because we start right there. I bet for half of us in the room, we don't ever really even pray at all. You bow your head when people pray. You think about a lot of things when people pray. Maybe your parents pray for a meal, but you never communicate with God ever. I bet half of us in this, in this room don't actually talk to God as much as we think we do because we don't pray hardly at all. Because if I said, okay, how much time do you spend in prayer by yourself when nobody's there? No meals in front of you, no um, families around you, no uh, small group is happening, no church is happening. Uh, if you took all those things away, let's just, okay, for example, send you to college. I bet half of us won't pray at all because we don't pray now. We pretend to pray. We go through routines of prayer. But when someone says, hey, let's close our eyes, bow our heads, and pray, we don't pray. We just bow our heads and close our eyes and think about something else. So he says, when you pray. So he's assuming that you know what prayer is. He's assuming you know it's talking to God. And he's assuming that you will do it. He says, okay, when my disciples pray, you must not be like the hypocrites. That sounds like what he said in the last couple things. He says, with giving, don't give like the hypocrites. Look what he says next. For they love to stand and pray. Isn't that funny? Jesus is condemning a group of people who love to stand up and pray. Right? Like if, if we said, hey, who are the people here that love to pray? Right? Who wants to stand up and pray? And the people who raise their hand, oh, me, me, me. He says it's from within those group of people that he has a problem. Right? He has a problem with people who don't want to pray, but that's not what he's talking about here. You could go to other passages that talk about righteous people pray. If you've never prayed, you're not a Christian, period. You, you realize that, right? Because like, if you've never talked to God, you, it's impossible for you to have a relationship with God if you've never talked to God. It's impossible for you to be saved if you've never talked to God. Because you never confess your sin, you've never repented, you never put your faith in Christ. Because if you've never talked to God or prayed, like those things are included in prayer. So disciples pray. Many of you have prayed. Most of you, I'd say, have prayed before in your life. And he says, but remember, hypocrites love to stand and pray. Where do they do that? Well, they do it in the synagogues, which was kind of like church for the Jews back then, right? It's what, they got together. It was a religious service, uh, small groups of people. And then someone would stand, or they wouldn't stand up, they'd actually sit down. Because um, back then, the teacher would sit down, and the other people would stand up. And then when you pray, you would stand up. So we often think of kneeling as a posture of prayer, which is true. Like sometimes in the Bible, people kneel down. But a lot of times, when it, especially if it's in a public setting, they'd all stand up out of respect. It's like, who are we going and talking to? We're talking to the king, right? So if the king walked in the room, you ever watched an old movie, right? And a military person comes in the room and what do the people do? They stand up, right? Or, you know, back in the old days, uh, a lady walked in the room. What did all the dudes do? They all stood up from their chairs, right? Even if they're not a... You know, even if they're more important than the lady, they would do it, right? Why? Because it was always a sign of respect. So you stand up as a sign of respect. That's what they did when they prayed. That's my point. So he says they love to stand and pray in the synagogues. That would happen. Um, and at the street corners, which is weird, right? Um, the only religious things that you know of that happen at street corners, right, are taking God's name in vain and street preaching occasionally, right? Um, which are two very different things. But like... Those are the only religious things you know that happen at street corners, right? Also, street corners don't mean anything to you, right? Because you sit at a red light, right? You know, and you drive past. But imagine there's no cars, right? So you walk streets, right? Like, uh, this is like in the quad at your school. That's a better example, right? You know how you got different places in your public high school, and there's the quad, and there's areas that people walk by. It's like, you know where hypocrites love to pray? They love to stand up on the stage in the middle of the pit at Laguna Hills, or um, at Mission Viejo, they do it on one of those little grass hills, or at San Juan Hills, they do it, uh, you know, on the staircase that leads down to the NPR, wherever. Like, they love to stand in the public places and pray, why would you stand in a public place to pray? It's a very good question. Look what he says next. He says that they may be seen by others. So that's the motive. These people would pray publicly, but Jesus says, why do they do it? They don't do it because they want God to answer their request. They do it because they want to have other people see them pray. It's even interesting how he uses the word seen, right? Because prayer is a, is a, is a you know, you would think it's a hear someone pray, right? Because you're communicating. But Jesus uses the word see. They don't even really care 
that they hear what they say. They just want to be seen praying, right? Because who knows what they're actually praying. Uh, the reason they would pray at the street corners is because the Jews at that time, just like uh, Muslims today, have different calls to prayer. Now, uh, if you ever go to an Islamic country, you'll hear on the loudspeaker some, you know, musical sounding words, and, uh, and then everyone stops and gets on their prayer mat, uh, kneels towards uh, Mecca, and starts praying. The Jews did something similar, not five times a day. Uh, usually it would happen about three times a day. And uh, there are some days, holy days, where it happened more than that. But the, basically the society would stop and say it's time to pray. Okay? If, if there was like a time, let's say at, at 12 noon, every day was time to pray, and you were at lunch at school, and you were a hypocrite, and you wanted people to see you praying, where would you, you know, just find yourself by chance when it was time for the call to prayer, right? Oh, I just happen to be there when it's time to pray. Oh, I happen to be in the most public setting, right? That's what was happening. It wasn't like they're posting up and saying, all right, everybody shut up, everybody shut up, I'm gonna pray. It was like everyone stopped to pray, and wherever you were, you stopped and prayed. Why do these people always end up on the street corners? Oh, that's interesting, right? Maybe their motive is because they are wanting to be seen by people. That's what was happening, right? There's some correspondence to us, like you want to find yourself in the right place so that you can have the right people see you pray, right? That happens sometimes. You only want to pray for a meal, maybe perhaps when there's other people that you want to impress by praying with a meal that are there. But if there's people you don't want to impress by praying for a meal, then you don't pray in front of them. See what I'm saying? It's similar to that. If there's a call to prayer, right, which we don't have many of, but eating is like the only call to prayer we do. And we do that three times a day. So I suppose um, those are our three calls to prayer. Uh, but he says, truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. We've only gotten through one verse, right? Uh, but you see how that phrase, truly I say to you, they have received their reward. Where do we see that before? Verse two, look up to verse two. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. Same exact phrase. Before it was about giving hypocritically, right? They gave to be seen, no reward from God, right? And then this time it's praying to be seen. Jesus says the same thing. No reward from God, right? You did a righteous thing, you prayed, that's great. Your prayer could have been a really good prayer. It could have sounded really good, but if the reason you did it was because you wanted everyone to see you praying, which is a heart thing, it's a motive thing, that's what Jesus is talking about, well then, no reward from God, which is worse than giving. If you got no reward for giving, you might be altruistic, right? Altruism is the idea that I only give for the sake of others, but I'm not gonna get anything in return, right? That's one thing. But to pray and not get anything, do you know what he's saying? God is not going to answer the prayer that you prayed. Like, it's even worse if your prayers get no reward than giving. Look what he says next. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. That's the same phrase that we saw up in verse four. Your father who sees in secret will reward you. So he's saying, hey, instead of public, ostentatious giving, don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. Do it, do it privately, do it secretly. Instead of public, in front of everyone praying, you know what you really should do is you should be private in your prayer. He's not saying that public giving is always wrong. He's not saying public praying is always wrong. But same thing as last time, it's, like a, it's, a, it's a qualification, right? Like this will help you. If you have a problem with pride and self-righteousness, then don't be the one to say, I wanna pray in front of people if that's an issue for you. It'd be better for you to, pray privately, right? And it's good for all of us to pray privately. We all should be praying privately, but he says to avoid the temptation, if you're one of those people that's a hypocrite like, th like these people, right? And you're even, even if you're not a hypocrite, even if you're drawn to that, right? Some of us, it's like, I would be a hypocrite if God didn't stop me, right? If you're drawn to that, well then be careful, beware of that. Because God sees your prayers. He, he knows your prayers. He hears your prayers, whether they're in secret or whether they're public. But it's just helpful when it's in secret because guess what? Why are you doing that? There's very, very few people who pour their heart out to God in genuine, sincere prayer by themselves and nobody's listening. No one's gonna hear. They're never gonna tell anybody else about it. It's rare that a person does that when they don't genuinely seek God. Right? That's a really good marker for who here is really godly and who here wants to be godly. It's the people that pray when nobody checks up on them. It's the people that pray with no accountability, with nobody else, but they go to the secret place and pray. Verse seven, he says, and when you pray, don't heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think they'll be heard for their many words. So first he calls out the Jewish, you know, 
uh, hypocrites in the synagogues. Now he says, what about the Gentiles? What about the rest of the world? There's a lot of prayer going on. And what do they do? They heap up these empty phrases. Uh, that phrase, heap up empty phrases, is one word in Greek, which means to babble. He says, don't babble like the Gentiles. But you're like, what does babble mean? Uh, so the translators, this is a good way to translate it, the babbling that happened in Gentile religion was they would list a bunch of gods. They'd start, you know, uh, let's just take the Greek gods. You start uh, Zeus, Jupiter, blah, blah, I don't know. Ju Jupiter is Zeus, right? My bad. Um, that was Greek and Latin. Um, Hermes, Aphrodite, please hear us, you know. What are the other ones? Um, Hades, maybe. I don't know if he heard prayer, whatever. I don't know. Uh, Hercules, no, he wasn't, <laughs> he wasn't a god. Um, I mean, none of them were gods, but whatever. Uh, <laughs> that's besides the point. But like, how would they pray? They would throw like all their gods out. Because you know what? Like there wasn't like one sovereign God over all gods. There was all these gods over different realms. So it's like, if I wanted something to happen, it's like, I got to check in. Did, did I cover my bases with like the thunder God? Because like, he's going to control some weather. And then, but beside it, you know, he'll control the seas and he kind of works with the, the weather. So I better cover both my bases. So I better talk to Zeus and Poseidon. And you know, Hermes, if he's going to deliver some message, like I should probably ask him too. And then all of a sudden I'm like, trying to cover my basis to get what I want, I'm throwing out all these names of gods, right? They're just babbling, all these empty phrases. And like what they were basically trying to do in the Gentiles, if you ever, if you ever read what some Gentiles like in the ancient world, pagans really is a better word than Gentile, but if you ever read what they say about prayer, they're always freaked out when they pray because they're thinking, I don't know if my God is listening. I don't know if I offer the right sacrifices. I don't know if there's, I said the thing enough times. They're always freaked out that they're not being heard. So he says, these Gentiles, they think they'll be heard for their many words. They'll pray for four hours to get it to rain, right? And they list all these names to different gods because they're, they're calling on all the gods to get them to pray. But look what Jesus says. But don't be like them. I mean, you don't even believe prayer is the same thing of what they believe prayer is. Don't be like them. For your father knows what you need before you ask him. You don't even need all the formalities that the Gentiles try to use. You can go immediately to God and immediately be heard. Like, there's no weird process. Like, you can go immediately to God based on what Jesus has done for you. Because he says he's a father who knows what you need. It's a lot about prayer, obviously. And then if you go to the next verse, look what it says. Pray then like this. Our father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we've also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, right? That sounds like, whoa, I've heard those words before, right? That's called the Lord's Prayer. What context does it come in? It comes when Jesus says, don't heap up empty phrases. And it's so funny because a lot of those words ring in your ears because people repeat them like empty phrases, like formulas, like if you come from a Catholic background, the Hail Marys and a rosary. And, 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 and you know, they call them our fathers, but it's because it comes from this, our father, but the Lord's prayer. You think God's gonna hear you because you repeat the Lord's prayer seven times before you start actually asking for what you want? You're praying like a pagan. Jesus literally, like, literally says not to do that. And then we take the Lord's prayer, not we, hopefully not you, but a lot of people who claim to be Christians, they take the Lord's prayer and do the very thing Jesus told them not to do with it. It's just amazing point is, Jesus is so concerned about our prayer life, and, and I hope that you're concerned about it too. Even when I bring up, hey, how many of us pray and don't actually pray? How many of us talk to God or maybe talk to other people while we're praying, but we're never actually praying to God? It's super important that we get this right. That's why, let's start here. Uh, first point, I want to stop praying a certain way. I want to start praying another way. It's on your worksheet like that. Um, both points are going to be like that. We're going to start with verse 5 and 6. Verse 5 says, stop praying to impress people. Verse 6 is going to say, start praying privately in your secret place. That's point number one. Stop praying to impress people, whether publicly or privately. Because here's the thing about the secret place. If you go to the secret place, just so you can tell someone publicly that you went to the secret place, how secret was that secret place, right? Don't think you're tricking God, right? Like, we, we, don't play that game. You go to the secret place to talk to God, and you don't typically tell other people what you told God. You don't broadcast it to everyone else. Stop praying to impress people. And that's why um, praying to impress people, that assumes a motive, right? And that's what Jesus is getting at. If the motive for prayer 
is to impress people, then don't do that. The answer is not, okay, now it's time, then let's stop praying altogether, right? That's not the solution here. That's replacing one sin with another sin, right? We don't do that. Repentance means you replace sin with a righteous activity or a righteous motive or heart. Yeah, good things for the wrong reason. That's what we talked about last week. Jesus warns about this in Luke 20, 46. He says, beware of scribes. That was this group of Pharisees, this religious people, who love to walk around in long robes, who love greetings in the marketplaces and the best seats in the synagogue and the places of honor at feasts, who devour widows' houses for a pretense and make long prayers. Amazing. Um, <laughs> what he's saying is, why, why did these... Uh, Scribes and Pharisees, why do they pray a long time with a widow, right? Because they wanted the widow to, to give the estate to them, right? It's just amazing that they use prayer and they use their authority to get from, in this situation, he says, like, like devouring widow's houses. How, do you, how does a religious person devour a widow's house? It's by saying, I want all that for me. Let me take control. I want all of it, right? We're warned in scripture, religious leaders, right? Um, which I'm a religious leader. Like I'm warned, don't take advantage of people who, you know, can be taken advantage of like these people because that's what the scribes and Pharisees did. Don't do that. Don't, don't try to take from people when they're vulnerable. He says they will receive a greater commendation, uh, condemnation. And they say, for, they make long prayers for a pretense. Why do they make long prayers? Because they want to get something from people. They want to convince people that they're righteous. They want to show someone, I'm trustworthy, let me pray with you. You know, that's why if you ever look at those like church chat accounts and it's like, oh dude, like I heard you're like in trouble, like let me just like pray, let me pray for you. And then they do it in front of everybody. It's like, shut up, dude. Like you're not praying for me. Like are you praying, or are you praying for me to just to like show everyone that you're like Mr. Alpha over here, right? And you think you're the, you think you're the dude. Like don't do that. Like don't strong arm me and say we're going to pray right now, right? Um, no, sorry. That doesn't mean you never say, hey, we should pray together, but what you don't say is, let me use you. Like, because really what that dude, if you know what I'm talking about, if you ever see the phrase church chat is a, it's an interesting phrase. Uh, hope, don't be a church chat, right? It, it's like that, that guy or that girl in youth group that like uses their, their uh, influence or whatever to kind of like make everyone else feel small, right? Uh, like less holy than them, right? Um, whatever. So uh, I, the kid in the youth group who does that, right? So uh, not picking on anybody. Hope don't be church chat. Don't whatever. Um, I wonder, like, was I a church chat? Like, maybe a little bit, but I didn't do this. Like, I, I didn't want to do this, right? I asked Dan Blankenship. Usually, I never mind. Um, yeah. I went to True North with a lot of people in this room. I went to True North with you. I went to True North with you and you and with you and with you. Back, I didn't know you though. Sorry, uh, and you. Where's Annie? Is Annie here? Oh, Annie! We're just talking about you. I was just in north of you, right? Um, we're talking about church chats, right? We've really broken away from the center point of this sermon, right? Um, we're really on the outside of the sermon now. Really, like we're all looking in on it. Um, we're not in it anymore. But uh, yeah, what was I saying? Oh, the the kind of person that's like, I'm going to pray so that everyone can look at me and say, Wow, that person must be righteous because they prayed for that person. Right? Uh, that's what the Pharisees were doing. And here's 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 what the scripture says. Ultimately. Um, Proverbs has two good verses I'd love for you to write down. Proverbs 15.8 says, The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is acceptable to him. So that parallelism is sacrifice equals prayer, right? So sacrifice is the religious worship of a wicked person God hates. It's an abomination to him. Even the prayers of a wicked person are an abomination to him. But... The righteous, when they pray, when they sacrifice, God delights in that, right? So the point is, prayer is not good if, if you're wicked and you're asking for wicked things for a wicked reason in a wicked way, right? Um, just because it has the forms of, of a good thing doesn't mean it, it's good um, if the mode is wrong. And then Proverbs 16.5, the other proverb I want you to write down, uh, it says, everyone who is arrogant in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Right? Those, those two verses use the phrase abomination. Right? Abomination means it's not just wrong, it's something that's repulsive to God. Right? There are things you think are wrong, right? and you're like, oh, yeah, it's wrong. Right? Maybe um, taking something from your employer, right? 
stealing stuff from in and out stealing stuff from Chick-fil-A, just like taking stuff that you know doesn't belong to you. But that's not like probably to you. It's not an abomination to you. You're like, yeah, people do it, like, but it doesn't stink to me, right? But when people, uh, how about this? If you stabbed your friend in the back, figuratively speaking, or I guess, you know, literally speaking, you'd be like, I hate that. I hate when people do that because I hate when people do it to me. It stinks to you. It's an abomination to you. This says that people who are arrogant in heart, you don't even have to like do something arrogant. This is just, if you do even a good thing, prayer with an arrogant heart, that's an abomination to the Lord. And be assured, he will not go unpunished. Like, just know. God's word says, oh, they'll, they'll get what's coming to them. People who are arrogant, people who pray arrogantly, right? He says here, go to the, the secret place. Go to your room, which uh, sounds like you're getting in trouble, right? Uh, go to your room and shut the door, right? That sounds like, you know, you did something wrong, uh, which I guess these people did. So if your parents ever say, go to your room and shut the door, and you're like, that's not very godly. They might say, well, you know, Jesus did say, go in your room and shut your door, right? Maybe that's if you're, never mind. I was going to parent, all the parents in here, maybe that's what you say. Hey, uh, what is it? Uh, hey, Matthew 6, 6. Hey, go Matthew 6, 6 for me. Oh, go to your room and shut the door. Uh, what does that mean? So he's saying in these ancient houses, there's a lot of different, you know, rooms, but most of them were public. People would walk through if it was a big room or if there's a big house, there'd be servants walking through or whatever. But there was one place that was generally the place where there was no traffic, right? Nobody's walking through it. It was a it was a secret place. It was a closet. Some people translate this closet, room, cellar. Like you can imagine the old, like, you know, basement wine cellars. That's, that's kind of the idea. Go to the place where you're not going to be heard. Go to the place where nobody's just like going to walk through. No one's going to, this even hits on the motive. No one's just going to happen to find you praying there. See what I'm saying? Like the place where you can pretty much be sure that there's not going to be a temptation for you to do it for other people's sight. Um, Daniel 6.10, Daniel does this. He prays in his secret place. The funny thing is he prays and his secret place is found out, right? And he gets in trouble for this. Jesus had a secret place. It says in Matthew 14, and in the same book, it says after he dismissed the crowds, this is Matthew 14.23, after he dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. And when evening came, he was there alone, right? And the next day, the disciples go and he walks on water. But the point is, he's separate from them and he went on a mountain to a desolate place. Some, um, some of the passages that say the same thing. Uh, went somewhere where people weren't going to find him. Um, what's your secret place? Where can you pray? Right? For everybody, it's different. If you have a room or a closet, if, you, if anybody has a walk-in closet, I would suggest that's probably a good place. A walk, like, not a walk-in closet that you share. <laughs> Okay, now for all of the rest of us who don't have a walk-in closet, um, where, you're thinking like, where can I go? I will challenge you with this. If I called you today at 4 p.m., if I said, hey, I'm gonna call you today at 4 p.m., you'll probably be at home. Um, I want you to pick up the phone um, and we're gonna have a serious conversation. It's kind of a private conversation. If I said that and you picked up your phone, where would you go in your house to talk to me and you felt like people wouldn't listen, Right? Would you go the walk-in closet, perhaps? Um, where else would you call me, right? Maybe you go to your car. Maybe you would go uh, not to the family room where everybody else was, right? You probably wouldn't want that. If you wanted to keep what I, you said, you wouldn't want anybody else to hear it, right? Uh, where would you go? Uh, maybe you go to the bathroom, right? And that's weird, but it's like a place people aren't going to go, Right? I mean, they'll, yeah, you go in the bathroom, but you're not, nobody else is going to go in while you're there, right? Sorry. I just said you don't go, and that made me laugh. Um, ha, ha, ha. But where would you go? Where would you, sorry, I should say, where would you call me on the phone? Would you, uh, try this, would you put on your AirPods and drive to a park and walk around a park? Maybe. That's fine. Like, that's fine. Because where would you go to have the secret place, to have a conversation that you didn't want everyone overhearing, right? That's probably a good, wherever that would be in your house, wherever that would be in your life, that's probably a good idea to, to give you where, maybe that's your secret place. And, and your car, it's, it's, that's not a stupid idea. A lot of you are only really alone in your car. 
Because you're at school with a bunch of people, you're at work with a bunch of people, then you get home, there's a bunch of people, and the only time you're alone is in your car, right? And you know that because sometimes you park your car at your house and you don't get out of your house because you're on your phone, scrolling your phone for 20 minutes, right? Because you're alone. So again, my point is, where is your secret place? I think places that are undistracted are good, right? So your car might not be the best place because there's a lot of distractions. Uh, maybe your office or wherever your computer is might not be the best place because your computer's open. That's, you're going to get distracted. That's probably not the best place. Wherever your phone is, I would suggest you probably, if you're going to go pray in the secret place, you know what's not really helpful? To have your phone buzzing and have your phone making noises and having your phone readily available so that you could reach for it even if no notification was there, right? Somewhere where it's out, out of sight. That's why things like a physical Bible are really helpful in your secret place. That's why things like maybe a journal with with a real pen and paper is helpful because you can't, you know, go on Instagram on the page, right? But you can do that on your phone. You can do that on the iPad. You might be able to take better notes, but maybe for you, right? Like for me, it's better to do it more in an analog way. But where can you go for the secret place and pray? Privately. Right? Yeah. Praying to impress people, going to secret place. You see how these are like two sides, right? Because if you go to the Secret place to pray so you can impress people. You miss the point. But why go to the secret place to pray? Because that's really where prayer needs to happen for you, right? Before you start praying in front of people, it's better for you to say, hey, if praying to impress people, if that's a problem for me, then you need more secret prayer with God. Where you're not telling everybody, I was praying about this, I was praying about that. But you and God, um, yeah. I said this before, but Public prayer is not wrong. The Bible calls people to public prayer. 1 Timothy 2, 1 to 3, Paul literally says, I want all men everywhere to lift holy hands and make supplications and prayers for all people, for those in government positions, those in high places, for those in the church, right? He goes on, like if you know that passage, he says, what should happen in church? You should pray in church. So the solution to this is not say, hey guys, we all got a problem with hypocrisy. No more prayer in church. No more prayer in your small groups. No more prayer with other people. You know why? Because I think actually the more we push prayer out of those things, the less a lot of people will pray at all, right? So it is a good opportunity to pray and to pray with people. But if your motive is to impress people, beware of that and hear that. And think about how tragic it is for so many people to pray so many times. And you might even think to make so many sacrifices and yet for the prayers never to get out of the ceiling because all they're doing is talking to themselves or talking to others. When you pray, do you pray to impress people with big words? Do you pray and make sure to include theologically sounding things or phrases to make what you say sound better? Do you pray and make sure that you pray certain things uh, in front of other people so they know that you're thinking about certain things and you're really trying to code sign to them about stuff instead of just asking God? Do you rehearse your prayers ahead of time? If you're praying in a group when someone else is praying, are you only concerned about the prayer that you're going to pray because you don't want to look stupid or dumb and you want to sound right in your prayer and you're not even focusing on what they're praying? Do you use clever phrases uh, on purpose to get some kind of attention in prayer? Do you call attention to yourself on purpose, right? And again, a lot of this is about your heart motive, right? Because a person can use theological sounding words and mean it. And it's not hypocrisy. So I'm not saying, hey, uh, all prayer that's done in front of people is hypocrisy. That's not what Jesus is saying. Jesus is also not saying all prayer that is done well or passionately. That's not all hypocrisy. A lot of that's true, right? But just you need to think for you, your motive beforehand cannot be, oh yeah, I want to do this to use God to lift myself up. That's what the Jewish people did. But the Gentiles, on the other hand, they did something else. They were trying to get God's attention or whatever God they thought they were praying to, by a lot of mindless phrases. They would, they would repeat things. They would, um, some of them, pray in an ecstatic prayer language, if that sounds familiar to anybody, uh, in, in Babel, literal Babel, glossolalia is the Greek term for it, that they'd, they'd blah, 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 and they did that, and they thought maybe if they could just do that long enough, their pagan gods would hear them, right? Um, now, I hope that none of you are you know, with your witchcraft group, pulling out different names of pagan deities and, you know, cutting your thumbs and trying to put some blood on the middle of a table and trying to, you know, summon pagan gods, right? Uh, 
I don't know if that's how it worked. Clearly, I'm ignorant to that. Uh, but, you know, I don't know what you do, right? Uh, I just, I would think that most of you are not a part of that. Some of you are, right? I'm not stupid. I know that some of you do do that, and you're a part of that, and you want to be a part of that, right? You're going to go to Voodoo Donut when you go to Austin, Texas, and you're going to, you know, you're going to do that kind of stuff because some of the darkness appeals to you, okay? Um, I don't say that completely disparagingly. Um, if that's true, if darkness appeals to you and you just kind of get a rise out of doing things that God doesn't want, just know uh, you're getting a rise out of doing things that God doesn't want, right? Just like people who love lying, just like people who love taking things from people, and just like people who love hurting other people. You are in the same category as that, right? So, but I assume most of you uh, are probably not like that. So it is hard to find, like, what's your equivalent to what the Gentiles were doing, right? Like, how would you ever do what the Gentiles do? I think it's basically in this. The Gentiles would repeat phrases. They would use, like, it was almost like incantations, like um, Harry Potter spells that, you know, if I had all the right spells put together, you know, again, this is something I, I've never watched that. And I never read that. So um, I was a good Christian growing up. Uh, I, I didn't, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, yeah, we did. I, I, I don't know. But I never watched Wizards of Waverly Place. I never watched Harry Potter. I wasn't, yeah, not allowed. Wasn't allowed. Um, I don't think you should boot that. <laughs> kind of a weird move over there, Austin, but okay. Um, was it, oh, is it RJ? Oh, yeah, okay, all right. Sorry, Austin. Um, yeah, but what was I saying? How would you possibly do this, right? I think the way that, you know, uh, a kid in youth group could possibly do this kind of thing is when you pray to not mean what you say, right? And that's where even these empty phrases, like, that's pretty close to how a person today could pray like this. If you think that by praying a long time, God's more apt to hear your prayer than if you prayed a short prayer, you're mistaken, right? If you use uh, impressive sounding language and you think that's, that's you know, more important to God, well, then just know God knows what you need before you ask him. So that's the wrong mentality. So here's what I want you to write down for the second point. I think this kind of encapsulates it. I want you to stop praying in mindless phrases, right? Because I think that was the problem. And start praying simply, to your father. That's what we're getting at. So instead of trying to string an elaborate set of words that are long and impressive um, and even mindless, right? Like these people would repeat prayers over and over again, repeat, 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 repeat over and over and over again because they thought maybe on the 134th time that their God would hear. Right? That's why like Jesus is corrective kind of helps us understand what the problem was because it's not entirely clear what the problem with the gibberish was, right? Like what were they doing? Well, I think when he corrects it in verse 8 and says, well, here's how you should do it. You should pray in such a way that knows that your father knows all your requests before you ask him, right? If that's the way that you pray, then the opposite of trusting and simply asking is trying to manipulate or hypocritically like throw stuff out there so that these people will hear, right? So that God will hear in particular. So one way to think about it is the first point, the problem with those hypocrites is they're trying to impress other people and think their prayers will be heard. And Jesus says, no. The second group, the Gentiles, they were trying to impress the gods and thought that if I impress the gods, then he'll hear or they'll hear and they'll understand and answer, right? And both those are wrong because if you're a Christian, your father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray simply. Uh, you, could, you could replace that word simply with honestly, genuinely, sincerely. All those words you could write down under that second point. Like what? Authentically, but I don't love that word because that's been co-opted by um, people who say just you know, be a sinner and keep sinning, right? Um, don't sin in your prayer, right? <laughs> that's why I wouldn't, didn't use the word authentically. If, if your uh, authenticity means that you're going to like cuss God out in a prayer, which some people do. I've seen Christians do that, right? Because they want to be authentic. That's, that's uh, blasphemy, right? So don't do that, right? Uh, but pray simply to your father. And, and, and part of the reason I said simply to your father, because Jesus uses the word father, do you realize that if you're asking God, who's your father for things, Jesus is saying, hey, your assumption about God needs to be he's listening and he's, he's ready to answer. That needs to be how you assume God deals with his disciples, because it is. The Gentiles, their assumption was their God needs to be summoned somehow. You need to impress that God first, and then he'll listen. Right? Christian doctrine and prayer is Jesus has done all the summoning that will ever need to be taken place for your prayers to be efficacious. 
right? The, the book of Hebrews talks about that. We have a great high priest. He's done what's necessary. So you don't need to offer a sacrifice every time. Jesus has done that. Now it's your job as his disciple to just come simply, to tell God what you need, to tell God what you're feeling, right? To tell God uh, what your sins are, to confess your sins to God, right? All that, simply. Uh, yeah, and even this, uh, this phrase, your father knows what you need before you ask him. If you're in Matthew 6, just drop down a little bit. Look at this part of the, the chapter, Matthew 6, 25, where he says, don't be anxious about your life or what you'll eat or drink, nor about your body. Is not life more than food, the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap, nor they gather into barns, but your heavenly father feeds them. Are you of not more value than they? Right? Like, you realize God cares about you more than the birds, and he, he takes care of them. He knows their need, right? Do you think God doesn't know your need? Of course he does. Why are you anxious about clothing? Right? Consider your, the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet, I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown in the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you little faith? Therefore, don't be anxious about what you eat or drink. Don't say, what we eat or drink. What shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things. And here's the quote, your heavenly father knows that you need them all. That's like the same language as verse eight. God knows what you need before you ask him, right? So don't pray in an anxious, concerned way. Pray in a trusting way, trusting that God knows what you need even before you ask him. Now, your response to that shouldn't be great. That's why I don't pray because God already knows what I need. We have an understanding. He says, I don't have to pray. Um, I said, where did he tell you that, right? Because um, he, he keeps telling you, and if you go in Matthew 6, just turn to the right one more time. Look at Matthew chapter 7, verse 7. Look what Jesus says. Ask, and it will be given. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, it will be opened to you, right? Okay, so what is Jesus saying? He's inviting you to ask. That's how this works. Your Christian life only progresses as your prayers progress. It only progresses as you continue to talk to God. It pretty much comes to a screeching halt if your prayers come to a screeching halt. And then he says in verse 9, Or which of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? Do one of you evil parents want to do that? No. If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly who your Will your father who's in heaven give you good things to those who ask, right? Point is, uh, you have to have a trust that God has your best interest at heart. Which, by the way, means if you pray for something, right? Something that you want, and you pray for it for a long time, and if God says no right now, know that that's probably better for you. Because you trust God, right? You want a certain relationship. You want certain grades. You want certain things. If God doesn't immediately answer those prayers, the first step is like, okay, Am I doing anything disobedient to God that like clearly makes it impossible for God in his natural course of things to give me whatever that thing is I'm asking, right? If you're saying, God, I just want people to like me, and then you're just like a jerk, it's like, well, you know, how does God want to fix the, the, the nobody likes me problem, right? How does God want to, want to change that? He might answer that prayer, but maybe the better way to do that is by changing you, right? Um, you start asking for something that is incompatible with your actions, well, you know, don't expect God to answer that prayer. But if there's things that you're like, I, honestly, I, I wish I had more friends, right? Well, you can do something about that and you can pray about that and know that, hey, if right now God doesn't answer your prayer request in the exact way that you want him to, maybe he wants something better for you, right? As long as you're doing what's obedient, right? Because you can't, don't blame God for your sin, right? Don't, don't say, well, he didn't answer this prayer. That must mean blah, blah, blah. It's like, no, it, it, even if we're just still in the friend thing, right? If you prayed for more friends or, or closer relationships and yet you don't care about people and you don't love people and you, like, don't, don't blame God and say, well, you know, that's why I hate True North. That's why I hate church because, like, nobody likes me. It's like, well, if, if you don't love them, if you don't invest in them, if you don't put yourself out there for them, if you don't stay longer and talk to them, right, why would God answer that prayer, Right? And again, we could get into a lot of reasons why God answers or doesn't answer prayer. But the point is, uh, you should pray simply, authentically, sincerely. Ask, and if God doesn't answer the way you want to, trust him. Um, and more than trust him, obey him. Right? Look, 
what his word says. See how you can be corrected. And even the act of prayer itself is one of those things that realigns our thoughts to God's. And that's why the next chapter, the next chapter, not the next chapter, the next sermon that we'll, we'll do after Revival Winter Edition is all about prayer. It's funny, last year we studied this prayer at Revival Winter Edition. This year we're going to Revival Winter Edition studying discipleship and then getting back into this, which is funny. It's ironic because, you know, there's not, if you didn't master it before, there's nowhere else you're really going to go than continuing to talk to God and pray. I want to just challenge you, like, you know, does your heart sound like the heart of people who really love God? Right? I don't know how the hypocrites prayed, right? Um, but I challenge you to ask yourself, does, do my prayers, does my heart actually sound like the other people who really seek God? And if you're like, well, I don't know anybody who I really trust knows and loves God. Well, great. You got a Bible full of prayers. Do you know that uh, one of the longest books in the Bible is all about prayer? It, it, it actually contains 150 prayers if you want to look at it that way book of Psalms, right? We talked about praying through the Psalms, and here's just a couple of phrases from the Psalms that reflect the heart of someone who loves God. Psalm 27, 4, David prays there, one thing I have asked of the Lord that I will seek after. One thing. I have one aim, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Right? I want to be worshiping God. That's what I want. To gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and inquire in his temple, right? I inquire with who? Right, with God and with others. Right? I want to be, that prayer is, I want to be with God's people more. I want to know God more. Right? You know, <laughs> this is a hard one. I want to be in church more. Right? It would be the closest way that you could apply that to your situation. Right? You've got no temple to go to. You've got no tabernacle. You've got the gathering of God's people here on Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights. In Psalm 63, David prays, Oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you, as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I've looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory. Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I'll bless you as long as I live. In your name, I'll lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food. And my mouth will praise you with joyful lips. That's the way David prayed. And again, I read that prayer, and you think, is that where your heart points? Like, does your heart point like that, or does that sound foreign? Does that sound like a foreign language to you? It's a good gauge of where you're at in your relationship with God. Another prayer from a man named Asaph, Psalm 73, verse 23. He says, nevertheless, I'm continually with you. You hold my right hand. This is him talking to God. You guide me with your counsel, and afterward, you'll receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there's nothing on earth I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For behold, those who are far from you shall perish. You put an end to everyone who is unfaithful to you. But for me, it's good to be near God. I've made the Lord God my refuge, that I may tell of all your works. Right? That's another prayer. That's how it ends. And we read those prayers and I ask you, hey, does that sound like how you pray. And now you might come back to me and say, well, um, that's like you showing me a highlight reel of LeBron James and saying, don't you like basketball? Why don't you, why, why don't you like jump like that? Why don't you shoot like that? Well, you probably shoot like that. But uh, why, sorry, that's an insult. Why, why don't you dribble like that? Why don't you, why can't you jump as high as he can? And your, your thoughts, well, like I'm not him, right? Um, I hope you know that these prayers of these people are not like outside of your reach, like the MBA is for almost all of us, right? That is out of our reach. You will never be in, right? I will not, not maybe some of you, I, probably not, right? I would, I would know at this point, right? Uh, no offense, middle row here, uh, but it's probably not gonna happen, but it's okay. You could, you could shock the world, right? But there are things that are out of your reach. This kind of praying is not out of your reach, right? But you gotta start. You gotta start by praying simply. You gotta start by praying honestly. You gotta start by going to the secret place, and praying. Make a plan to do that. The goal is not to go to the secret place so that you can get good at praying, so that you can come back out and impress everyone with your good praying, right? So don't mishear that. Don't get the wrong motives with all this. The goal is to be sincere, right? Because Jesus is going to tell us how to pray and what to pray, uh, and all that will be helpful. We'll talk about that next time, but let's pray uh, now and seek God right now. Let's pray. 
God, we're humbled by the reality of your word. We know that Jesus is telling us the truth. We recognize that. We recognize that we all are tempted to impress whenever we do righteous activities. So we pray that we would only focus on you in those things. Uh, We're so thankful that you hear our prayers. We're so thankful that Jesus has done what's necessary for us uh, to pray to you simply. I just pray that this week we would be more consistent and more faithful and more heartfelt as we go to you. I pray that some people who never pray would start praying. Uh, Pray that they'd even uh, start praying even now, knowing that you're a good God who wants to hear our prayers and that you invite us to pray. I ask that you would help us with this. I ask that you'd be pleased as we respond to this sermon. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.